Well, welcome to this uh, Crawford School uh, Public Policy Forum uh, on uh, Leading China Wear. Uh, this forum uh, occurs on the occasion of the launching uh, of the latest uh, East Asia Forum quarterly uh, on Leading China Wear. Uh, this quarterly, of course, is a, associated with the online East Asia Forum, which is a daily commentary on uh, Asian economic, uh, political, and public policy affairs. Uh, and uh, we're pleased to have this panel together on this occasion to talk about the issues that are raised in this latest issue of the forum and a few issues beyond those raised in the latest issues of the quarterly. Uh, uh, we have had over the years, a few years, uh, four or five years, we've been producing the quarterly now, ad hoc occasions like this, launching the subject matter in the forum and forums here at the ANU, around the region, and in the States, in the United States, actually. Uh, but we've not done it on a routine basis before. This is the start of a routine of discussion uh, in this kind of forum uh, of the issues raised in East Asia quarterly uh, every time it comes out. Uh, this one on China. The next one will be on uh, Indonesia's choices coming up to the presidential year uh, and looking uh, beyond that. Uh, it's uh, obviously an appropriate time to talk uh, about uh, Chinese leadership. We've got a new leadership in place, uh, the fifth generation leadership in place. Uh, now for effectively a year, it was about this time last year uh, that the leadership was confirmed in Beijing. I think half the team, well certainly Yun Ling was there, uh, were in Beijing around that occasion. Uh, and. Uh, They've taken up their responsibilities formally. Uh, and we've got uh, the third plenum coming up uh, in a few days' time, really, next week, uh, about which there are high expectations in respect of uh, changes of direction in Chinese, uh, at least economic policy, and maybe other things as well. We don't know. Uh, but we couldn't have a better panel to talk about these things than the one we've got here today with uh, Kerry Brown from the China Centre at the University of Sydney. Uh, my old friend uh, Zhang Yong Ling from the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, who's really the godfather of uh, all things international to do with the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences and a few other things as well, I suspect. Uh, John Garner, uh, who's um, uh, formerly Fairfax correspondent in Beijing uh, and uh, now become a sort of academic. <laughs> writing tomes down there somewhere in, in Melbourne. And uh, Richard Rigby, uh, who's uh, here at the Crawford School, but is also a director of the uh, China Institute here at the ANU and uh, uh, associate of Jeremy Barmes, who's in the audience somewhere, but I can't see Jeremy, uh, uh, in our China and the World group here at the ANU. So it's a great uh, group of people to uh, have talk about the issues. And I should say that uh, Kerry and Richard, of course, edited this last uh, issue of East Asia Forum Quarterly, and uh, John, Kerry, uh, and uh, Richard all wrote pieces in here. Uh, Yung Ling, you're the only one that didn't deliver your piece. <laughs> but next time. <laughs> well, uh, uh, Kerry, uh, let's start with you. Uh, uh, how do you interpret the political atmosphere in, in China uh, after the leadership change and leading up to the third plenum. Great. Well, thanks. Thanks very much for inviting me here to this lovely campus. I am in shock <laughs> because I have just seen a traffic jam in, in Canberra. <laughs> so I suppose my first thing would coming here to listen. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. <laughs> um, so I suppose my first thing is just never expect um, what you expected. <laughs> uh, and so I guess for this leadership, uh, the outcomes last year that we observed were a statement of brute political purpose and power. And I guess we've been spending a year working that out. And I guess if you look at the two key figures, Xi Jinping and Li Keqiang, you have two sort of um, strategic outlooks which work well so far. I think they work well. The first for Xi Jinping is, I think, to talk about more abstract notions of historic mission, of the kind of entitlement of the party to do the things it does, because it is the thing that will make China a rich, strong country. That seems to be the kind of main thrust of his narrative. 
and also to try and sort of restore the moral purpose of the party, which is a bold thing when you have extreme complexity, extreme kind of uh, different voices in society now that we can see lots of evidence of. So I think <coughs> he really talks of this sort of uh, quite strange language of, you know, kind of the, 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 the moral function of the party, the, 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 the party's um, it, it, responsibilities. And he's done that for about 20 years, but now he's in the leadership position. It has a very different kind of tone about it nationally. Um, the second, Li Keqiang, I mean, I think you have a kind of pretty clear macroeconomic strategy which is heavily predicated on the outcomes of uh, urbanization. I mean, I think that's at the core of what this leadership have to practically do in the next decade in order to um, deliver the kind of higher, faster, uh, sustainable d uh, growth that they want. Um, I'd only say on the um, two things that are really striking. First, the deployment of symbolic resources. It seems a strange thing, but I think the party's heart in its elite leadership, the people that we look at most, is that they probably want to be populist. They probably really want to kind of mobilize people more emotionally and kind of do the sort of things that, I mean, John Garneau has been writing about, Bo Xilai, reach out and sort of really get people excited and mobilized, but obviously extremely cautious because that may lead to highly uncontrollable outcomes. And suppose the second thing that they do uh, seem to be doing quite a lot of um, is, is, you know, kind of defining specific political spaces and ceding territory where it's not so important, having a highly strategic sense of who their enemies and allies are, and being able to pick on particular groups who they can beat up on because it's easy, whereas they have a stronger sense of who their allies are. It seems to me, and I'd be interested to hear the views of the other panelists, that the biggest and most important players in the game from now on will be provincial elite leadership because they're going to have more powers to have decentralization, basically. This is why these strange events in Herbay and elsewhere, you know, management cleansing, basically, because the provincial leaders, I think, are going to be absolutely key to the political purpose of this government as they try and create a more sensible polity and a more manageable polity. Well, let's come back to that question of uh, interaction between the central and provincial leadership later on. But uh, Yun Ling, uh, how does it look from the inside to you? Uh, on which, which side? Sorry. On the inside of uh, Chinese politics. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think it's, you know, since it's on leadership of the Communist Party, so there is a continuation of, of the politics. So uh, in the past, a lot of people expect that maybe someone, someone will, you know, uh, create a different uh, political reform. If you see the new leaders group, they strongly uh, emphasize the continuation of uh, the China politics. But that does not mean that the leadership will not change. Uh, so they, they, they consider themselves if the reform, reformists, uh, because um, you know the two pressures that they have to uh, manage. One that is accumulated problems, uh, the in the accumulated in the past uh, more than thirty years after the reform and opening. Uh, another one that is uh, they they think that this leading group, they have to realize the first step of a China dream, that is by 2020, as uh, designated by the Deng Xiaoping, that uh, 2020, that uh, China become a, you know, a xiao, the, uh, so that's, that's the time uh, they have to you know, uh, uh, realize. Uh, that is why, you know, suddenly Xi Jinping pick up this word, uh, China dream, because the China dream is very close uh, by, by uh, 2020 or by 2021, 20, uh, that is 100 years of Communist Party. So they have two 100 uh, years. One is Communist Party 100 years and uh, 100 years of People's Republic of China by, you know, the 2050. Uh, that China become a more advanced country. So 
uh, they have a high pressure, uh, one that is to lead this process of uh, uh, modernization, economic growth, uh, welfare oriented you know, society, they have to, to, to go. The second, that uh, China now enter the second stage of uh, modernization, economic development, that is uh, the, according to the East Asia model, that uh, government and state are controlled and or managed economic growth and transformation now come to the second stage that you have to largely reduce the role of the government, readjust the relations between government and, and, um, and the market. So if you see immediately after their uh, leadership, uh, they have already have done a lot of change uh, reduce government direct intervention, uh, strengthening the role of the, the market, the forthcoming, the meeting will, the document will see more of this kind. And also China need further uh, liberalization, but this liberalization is different from the past. Because in the past, just open the country, receive uh, FDIs, you know, use its you know, advantage of cheap labor, as a world factory export and lead the economy to grow. But the second stage is different because the liberalization close related to its own internal domestic economic and, and system. So that is why they set up Shanghai uh, free trade zone uh, ex experiment. And they, they make it very clear this experiment is not for make Shanghai uh, more uh, prosperous is for the institutional reform. Experiment, you know, provide the platform for, uh, you know, the uh, overall comprehensive reforms in China. So I think, uh, but they, they also have their own problems. One that is, for instance, like Xi Jinping as considered to be accessor of, uh, you know, uh, of the revolution, of the revolutionary generations. So the power now hand over to his hands. So we have to show uh, to, to people, to party, that he will continue uh, to make his success rather than you know, as a failure. Another one, they have to feed people's the, you know, uh, diversified, increasing uh, demand from all, all sides, you know, a better life, uh, 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 a just for, society and legal based you know uh, politics and clean government whatever so a lot of a lot of new requirements uh, like environment now people have the food now they, they, they require the, the higher standard of life so they have to meet all this kind of also increasing pressure for young generations young students they have to find a better job rather than as you know rural labor force whatever kind, they, if they can earn the money, that's okay. But the new generations are quite different. They are eager to just find a better jobs rather than you know, dirty or, or you know, hard works. So, so you, you see very diversified uh, demands from society. And, and also the society is still in the midterm of uh, transformation. Uh, there are a lot of you know uh, conflicts, confrontations, and, you know, <coughs> uh, contradictions. You have to find a way how to keep it on the one way. The stable transition will continue. If any kind of a big riots and you know disorder, that will uh, disrupt this this process. So on the other hand, you have to make society more open uh, and more flexible and let the people to have more voices and rights to participate and, you know, and, and so. But this is not, should, it not should be on the old ways, you know, uh, but you have to uh, move to a more legal based uh, uh, system. So a lot of, you know, uh, challenges to them, how to handle the, 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 the balance between the continuation and, and, and the radical reform. Uh, not just economic, and social, and, uh, and political. John, uh, what do you think, uh, what do you want to add to the story about the <laughs> atmospherics? Yeah, I'd, like to, I'd like to build on what Professor Zhang was saying, and that is, uh, he talked about the accumulated problems, and 
you know, I think that the <coughs> generation you talked, to, you talked about, the fifth generation, these guys see themselves as the second generation. You know, they are the children, they are the successors, and it's actually their responsibility to not just fix the accumulated problems, but to solve what they see as an acute crisis in, um, in, in society, uh, and more specifically in the party's legitimacy. Um, so I think they come to it um, with vigour that we haven't seen in leadership for a long, long time. Uh, to use the words of one of these red aristocrats, you know, the, the last mob were playing past the parcel with a time bomb. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so they're not wasting any time. I think it's been astonishing how fast um, Xi Jinping has moved on a whole wide range of, of fronts. And I think there are a whole bunch of contradictions that are embedded in those movements as well. Um, it's become a lot clearer, I think, since the trial of Bo Xi Lai, uh, the political stance they're talking about. And Professor Zhang talked about continuity, but it's really, it's really also about um, redressing a discontinuity that they saw between the first 30 years of, uh, of, of the People's Republic and the reform era. And so they're actually partly going back to Deng, you know, 1992, the whole Shenzhen opening up reform that's been very strong in the rhetoric, but they're also going pre-Deng and to say, we need to actually restore the, the credibility of the dynasty that our parents created. And I think there are a whole bunch of really difficult and important contradictions there. Uh, to do that, you have to retell the story. I mean, Deng didn't want to talk about the first 30 years because it's actually not a very easy story to to tell, um, you know, 30 million people dying or more in the famine, the Cultural Revolution, you know, that's basically what the first 30 years was. But these guys want to go back and sort of reframe that story in a positive light um, and to take the dynasty forward in this new, really complicated, pluralistic world that they find themselves in. So I think it's, um, it's very uncertain. I think that um, there's a lot of change. These guys are not scared about picking fights with anybody, as far as I can tell, um, but we really don't know how these political and economic imperatives are going to be resolved. Richard? Yeah, well, the trouble with being stuck on the end, and I admit <laughs> I did stick myself on the end, <laughs> <laughs> is, is that there's not much left to say, and there's nothing that anybody has said that I, I take exception to either, which makes it even more difficult. But there, there are one, one, or, one or two things I might add or just rephrase perhaps uh, and, and, I, and I very strongly agree particularly what, with what John has just said. I mean I think the, the feeling had been, it had been pretty much accepted wisdom that each generation of leadership post Mao had that much less authority than the lot before. So Deng had a lot but not quite as much as Mao. Uh, Zhang had not as much as Deng. Who didn't have as much as Zhang? But suddenly here we are with Xi Jinping and boy he's got a lot and he's really asserting himself as a, as a strong and very, very purposeful leader, and the people that he's got with him uh, seem to be quite clearly on the team, and there is a sense of, of, of clarity of view, but also of a crisis, which I'd agree. You know, they've, they've inherited a whole pile of problems uh, and are taking it on themselves to try to address these, these issues. And it's not just the economic issues. I mean, generally, as people look to the third plenum, they're thinking mainly about uh, what sort of economic reforms are going to be introduced, and, and, that's, and that's fair enough. And now that I'm in the Crawford School, I have to at least uh, affect to think that economics <laughs> matter. <laughs> of course they matter. They matter hugely. In, 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 not, not least in... Maybe in soundly in, Marxist. Yeah, in not, do I pass? Uh, no, I mean, obviously not least in, in, in terms of fundamental importance of the relationship between Australia and China. But it's not that. I think there are other things will be coming out in, in, in the plenum too, things which will touch on on aspects of culture, on aspects of ideology. And they may be things, they may be formulations which are, are, are not going to be as widely welcome to people of a more liberal disposition. But I, so I think there is this, this sense that we really need to sort of reform the party ranks. Obviously, we need to clean the party, the, the, the more than Orgean stables within the party, but we are, we are, but we are, we are strong. But you have to get, you can't just fight corruption, you have to sort of reassert the importance of the ideology and what makes the party important. And here I think this is where the idea that you can't deny the first 30 years and only concentrate on the second 30 years 
becomes really important because if all you do is concentrate on the second 30 years, all you're really saying is, well, you know, we're here to help you all make money, and that's basically all, all, all there is to it. it. It's not actually all that much of a mission. Uh, you so need a vanguard party. You need, no, that's right. You've got, an, you've got the vanguard party, and the, you know, she is here. Look, I've, I've, I've come to tell you this whole story. So that ties in with the dream. And the, the two other formulations, one which Professor Jung mentioned, the, uh, the, the two centuries, the 200 years, the, uh, 1920, 2020, and then 1949, 2049. There's a really interesting question is how you get from the 2020 to the 2049. The 2020 thing is relatively straightforward. We keep you know, more opening and reform, and you're tightening up the party, clearing out corruption. <laughs> but, but when you get from that Xiaokangshe, where under conditions which are relatively well known, not all that different what we have, to what we're looking forward to in 2049, which is a really a fulfillment of the of the China uh, dream, you know, the revivifying of China, the the big dream, uh, which involves a whole lot of other elements, which have been intrinsic to what China has been trying to do at least from the 18, 1860s, 1870s on including things like democracy, constitutionalism, these sort of things, they have to be brought in at some, some stage. And I think already you can see, see trying to, um, to, to find ways in which you can maneuver uh, to, to make that, that transition. The, the third formulation is one which is quite relevant to us, uh, which has uh, just started being used, uh, this, this idea of a community of common destiny. Now, this, this is the foreign policy aspect of this thing. Uh, she made a very important speech on, on, on regional foreign policy a couple of weeks ago, which was intended by the entire standing committee of the Politburo, who, who actually all expressed their agreement with uh, what she had said. It was kind of <laughs> very <impressive>. useful. <laughs> yeah, surprise, surprise. Uh, but it was an important, it was, a, it was a very important speech. And he talks there about a community of common destiny. And the question for Australia is, Migun uh, Gugunti. Are we, are we in Australia going to be part of that community of common destiny? There was an article in Global Times just the other day which suggested that we could be if we uh, shaped up properly, if we behave, but uh, well, uh, we shouldn't let's, take let's it for Let's granted. come back to talking about that dimension of it uh, in a moment, but you know, let's take up the, the, the dream for a moment and, and how the dream does play into the narrative uh, of the party and going forward. Uh, how do you see that? Uh, yeah. I, I think on the point which is just made, this issue of who are they talking to is important. And I don't think they're talking to many people. I don't think they're talking to us. Uh, we don't really kind of figure in this a great deal, apart from sort of background, you know, sort of music background noise. And I don't think they're talking to Chinese society. And you refer to Chinese society. I don't know what that means anymore. I mean, what is just Chinese society? I mean, it's, it's just bedlam, absolute bedlam. So <laughs> they are talking to, they, ha they have an idea of focus groups, I'm sure. Zhongnanhai has this sort of focus group kind of outlook where they're talking to particular constituencies and this language means something to those constituencies and therefore that's all that matters. That's why brute political focus is probably at the heart of the thinking, the mindset of these people. So in 10 years as an official dealing in the British government with politicians, I only learned one thing and that is politicians are from Mars. <laughs> and therefore, um, and it's true, and I used to think that Chinese politicians were not politicians, they were administrators. This was a big con. In fact, <laughs> Chinese politicians are also from Mars. <laughs> They're from the same damn place. Um, and therefore, uh, the only thing that matters, I, I mean, this is something I've, I thought when you look at the, the kind of demands, the complex challenges that uh, panelists have talked about. So what is the kind of only thing that the leaders must have in their kind of equipment, basically. Um, they must have very powerful intuition. I mean, it's got to be, Chinese politics seems to me to be defined by a very privileged position for intuition. You cannot really explicitly state your aims um, beyond very abstract or very general ones. You must be reliant on intuition. And I think that this why it's impossible to know what lies in the hearts of this leadership because the only thing which will really induce some knowledge of what their real, real core values and beliefs are is when they come to the crossroads moment, so when the crisis comes. What we do know, though, I think when you look at this standing committee is the one thing that unites six out of seven of them in their provincial records is 
diverse but successful ways of dealing with crisis. So for Jiang Dejiang, it's been violence. If you have problems in your um, province, you smash it with violence. With uh, Jiang Gaoli, it's just make people rich so they shut up, which actually also works. Um, with uh, Li Keqiang, it's you know, basically when you have a crisis uh, like the blood crisis or the three fires crisis in Liaoning, you know you have massive cover-ups, but you deal with it. And probably he's the, most, uh, the least successful at dealing with crises. Um, and so this sort of ability to deal with crises is, I think, distinctive of most of this leadership, apart from Liu Yunxian, who's only ever been a, a demagogue and, a, and an ideologue. And so I guess that that's the kind of core thing that really has them where they are now. And I suppose the final thing I'd say about the sort of atmosphere of this leadership is it is the return of politicians, um, which I guess is part of what Bo Xilai's story was also about, that you can't just do it by the instrumental outcomes of politics, by making people more wealthy, because in fact, the problem that they've discovered, which we discovered a bit earlier, is when you make people wealthy, you also create fantastic complainers. Yunling, how do you, I mean, uh, Kiri Cole's many interesting things, but he didn't really answer my question. <laughs> See, I'm a politician. <laughs> You've been there. Uh, how, do you, how do you see the utility of the China dream story? <laughs> uh, I think uh, Chinese leaders come from Earth rather than Earth. <laughs> <That's a personal. laughs> because, you know, they uh, work from low level gradually, you know, and uh, move to the top and know <laughs> where, where they come from. And uh, where it's, it's unlike probably the, the Western politicians, they always said the politician from, you know, early stages and always played all these games uh, on, on this uh, platform. Uh, but uh, come to this, how to realize this, this dream. I think first, this, by 2020, they consider still, you know, the target is very clear from a poor China to a welfare China. So, uh, so more as economic aspect. So they con now they currently debate whether China could uh, overcome this middle income trap. So whether the question, direct question is whether leaders have ability and uh, uh, the way to lead China continue to grow. That is, uh, outside observers seems uh, more pessimistic, but uh, the Chinese experts seems more uh, relatively you know, uh, optimistic because the potential of growth in China has not the ended, and a great potential still there, but come to the new stage from a cheap labor advantage to move to a higher stage. And if you travel to China in the, in the local, you see a lot of potential still there. We need, uh, can create uh, this uh, growth. For instance, uh, as mentioned uh, by Brian, that uh, this uh, urbanization, if you transform uh, 300 million uh, uh, labor force into an urbanized uh, citizen, so itself can create a lot of demand. Uh, and that's one thing. Another, China still have a lot of uh, 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 regional disparity, a lot of uh, potentials to invest. And also Chinese companies have now uh, come to the second stage from you know learning and to uh, to uh, or more innovative, uh, so so a lot of uh, potential still there. The optimistic view, China, however, that uh, from higher growth rate and in the past uh, more than 20 years, about 10 uh, percent come down to the 7 percent above, and 7 uh, percent. If you 10 years calculated, uh, uh, that uh, will uh, you know double the size. So uh, by 2020, uh, according to this calculation, and China could uh, uh, reach about uh, you know uh, 13,000 US dollar per capita <coughs> GDP, and uh, maybe World Bank will raise the level uh, uh, to that uh, 20,000 by that time. But uh, if you consider <coughs> renminbi, will appreciate it. So so something they, that that's. 
it's not easy because in the East Asia, we, in the world, we only have few uh, economies in the past over uh, past this middle income trap. But uh, so that makes leaders more confident to do that. Um, but as consensus building, you have to change. You have to do big reform. As I mentioned, from uh, a government, you know, led growth model to the market, you know, uh, uh, the leading role in the, in the future. And also you have uh, changed all this kind of uh, uh, policy uh, approaches. So I think on this, there is strong consensus. This group of leaders, most of them will end the first time and then uh, new, new, you know, uh, guys will come up to, to be on the top position. Uh, they all feel their, their uh, uh, responsibility. So they all know where they should go. On this all matters, I don't think there is a debate. So you can describe them some uh, conservative or reformist, but on this matter, China has to change. And the direction and to market, liberalization, you know, legal based, uh, and all this direction, I, I think there is no big differences. And, and Bushilai's case, I, it's hard to, to explain it. I think it's a, it's a special case. It's not as uh, forcing obstacle of the reform, and, 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 but uh, uh, so I think the unity among themselves now, they then can get among the top groups. It's not that the, in the last four since we really had some debates the direction during the late 1980s and early 1990s, and, and Deng Xiaoping uh, set the clear that uh, the, the, the direction. So that lasted for, for quite a long time. So now I, I think uh, on this matter there is no big debate uh, among them. Richard, you wouldn't come in on this. Uh -huh. uh, well, partly just the play on words between Mars, Mars and Earth. I mean, I'd say <laughs> yes. I think the Chinese leadership want to say quite clearly that they do come from Earth, and quite specifically <laughs> from, from the yellow Earth, from the Huang <laughs> Tudi of Yan'an, and they're trying to re-establish uh, that sort of umbilical connection, but at the same time saying that there is no contradiction between this and realizing our dreams of full-blown full, full modernization. So you see Xi Jinping going quite early in his leadership to Xi Bai Po to you know, pay the traditional homage, uh, to, to reiterate you know, what Mao said when, when he was first at Xi Bai Po and the, the, the warnings about how we have to, have to behave once we take over the whole country and so on and so forth. But of course, he'd also by then already been to, um, been to uh, Shenzhen uh, and, and you know, made very clear statements there of his support uh, and and that, was, that was taken for the, you know, the, again, the more liberal reformist people in the Chinese system were very, very encouraged uh, by both what he said right at the beginning about how we're going to proceed on the, on the basis of constitutional approach to things, and then going off to, uh, to, to Shenzhen. As subsequently, you know, other, other things happened than was said, which uh, uh, made, made people um, perhaps not quite so wildly enthusiastic as they might have been to start with. But while at the same time you're know, continuing to, to use more language of, of the Maoist era, at, at the same time there, there is no stepping back from the, the language of the Deng era in terms of opening and reform. And, and I think this again, why he's saying you can't use the first 30 years to oppose the second 30 years or, or vice versa. At a conference in uh, Chengdu in June, uh, global wealth conference. Uh, he, he made a very, very strong and clear statement of support for the whole process. We need to do more. Uh, it was a ringing endorsement of the role of foreign enterprises in China. We need more rather than, rather than less. So uh, I think, again, it is trying, trying to establish this, uh, the coherence of what, you know, to many people doesn't actually appear to be all that coherent or could quite clearly, uh, quite easily become incoherent. And when you're facing big challenges, sometimes a bit of old time religion doesn't hurt. You know, and, and some of the things that Bo Xilai did which were popular, people clearly liked, well we can get rid of Bo, but it doesn't really have to get th th throw out that other stuff as well. You know, so, so the, the Bo Xilai version of Hillsong 
you know, is sort of being, being, being taken <laughs> up uh, quite, quite widely. If it works, <laughs> fine. Uh, I'll, I'll let, let, let me yeah, try and uh, I don't make, make I'm just trying to forge some consensus on the panel here. Uh, I mean, uh, just 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 on this question, I think it's a crucial question that, that uh, Yun Ling has emphasised: the consensus around the commitment to the reform agenda, as, as it was defined. By. Uh, yeah, look, I, I I agree. There's a consensus that there needs to be economic reform, but what there's no consensus about is. Uh, how to do that without, with, put the other way, but there's also a movement against to lock down the institutions which most people, which many people believe need to be changed to facilitate economic reform. Mm, that's so that's the essential contradiction. Mm -hmm. And that's perhaps, I mean, there's been a lot of fun and games over the Shenzhen, sorry, the Shanghai um, uh, FTZ, what's the acronym? And so, and that has not gone smoothly. There's no question about that. So what specifically are they kind of arguing about what's not adding up? Um, <coughs> you know, I suspect that part of it is all the things, a lot of the things that Li Keqiang had in mind for Shanghai to make the economy, to revitalise the economy from that small hub in Shanghai, actually in some way contradict, you know, the broader program. And so at the very same time... Well, I, I think it's actually simpler than that, isn't it? Because, I mean, the sort of reform, mm -hmm. uh, capital market reform, essentially, mm -hmm. uh, and you can't do that in a geographically limited and uh, constrained space like you could do a free trade zone. I mean, that's the essential contradiction in it, and that's what the discussion has really been focused on. Uh, and uh, uh, it, it's the practicality of doing uh, financial market liberalisation, a capital account reform around a, a special economic zone. It's a, a contradiction in terms. Uh, in that case, why did somebody as smart as Premier Li Keqiang yeah. raise something like that and get endorsed at the Politburo? Like, um, I find that you know, there's something funny going on there. And um, perhaps Shanghai FTZ was uh, the Premier's way of downgrading what had been a national kind of reform plan to make it localised and less threatening, and that didn't fly. I just think there's a lot of questions that haven't been answered about that. We'll find out a little bit more next next, next week. Next week, yes. I mean, the that symbolism of it's not just limited to Shanghai. There mm. will be the other yeah. experiments. And also on political reform, I think uh, the uh, I emphasise this continuation that uh, they try to any means under the party leaders uh, uh, leader system. So it's, if you see the past more than 30 years reform and anything can be done without change of China's, you know, basic political uh, system. So uh, it's open for, uh, if you see the, uh, in, in the week uh, ahead, we can see a lot of uh, political reforms and relating to uh, legal and administration mm -hmm. and a lot of things will be happen. So in the, in the, in the future, uh, 10 years or 20 years, and it's uh, quite open for, 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 for the direction, if any, they need uh, to, to think to change. Uh, that so, is a very encouraging little yeah. um, data point, and that is there is some focused work on making a more institutionalised legal system strictly de defined. But at the same time, you know, around it, all sorts of other things threaten to overwhelm you know, that very important project. Well, let's uh, try to get a handle on uh, which arm is winning in this game, the control arm or the, or the uh, freeing of the market arm, basically. Uh, not only the economic market, but uh, inevitably, to some extent, the political market. Uh, because that is the essential contradiction. That's the complication in, in consensus commitment to the liberalisation that we expect coming through this process uh, and uh, the management of it in a way that's going to make it work. Uh, uh, how do you see that playing out uh, on the evidence sure. that we have so far? <laughs> so I'll try and answer your question this time. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm sitting here in fear and trembling. <laughs> um, I mean, um, the, the thing is most of the articles in the uh, East uh, Asia Forum that, that we've put together this, this edition, in a sense, are representative of people thinking very logically and rationally about where are the challenges and how do you change those. And in a sense, of course, people like Yao Yang and Huang Xinghai, who's now in the leading group, I think, in the economy in Beijing uh, from Shanghai. So he was intimately involved in the Shanghai you know, development of the International Finance Center. Yu Keping has obviously written a lot about uh, democratization in China. Um, I mean, <clears throat> in a sense, despite the enormous knowledge that they have, um, I would argue 
that all the things that they have written um, are kind of subsidiary to the key quest for the party, um, which is to uh, create the right atmosphere or to create the right mood within society and within a particular mobilizing elite to, to, effect, to, to effect change, to effect stability and change. Um, I mean, the thing about the political reform is, it's, as, as long as you don't sort of change the system, that's a bit like a, a nice sort of synergy with capitalism. You know, you can have any color you want as long as it's black. You can have any system you want as long as it's communist. So uh, is that a choice? I mean, the thing is, this is a pragmatic leadership. And so I think when they reach a problem, I mean, a problem can be a great asset to them because then it will create that mobilization and it will create the necessity within this very dynamic system for the kind of changes that they want to go for. Now, the market, um, is obviously a huge ally in what they want to do. And urbanization is the means to have a more vibrant market with higher service sector, um, higher consumption. Um, and I think Li Keqiang is, is a politician. He might not be from Mars, but uh, maybe <laughs> from the moon, um, because um, he's, got to sail, uh, he's got to sell this to many Chinese rural dwellers now. Um, he's got to sell the advantages of more disruption, of more sacrifice, of moving to urban areas where they are going to give up. I mean, there is going to be a cost for them in this. And the migrant laborers and the people who live in the countryside in China have been the great um, foot soldiers of reform. They have, I think, really sacrificed a lot. So in the next decade, if the 70% urbanization is possible, there's going to be a huge cost for these people, and Li Keqiang's number one thing of his job description is to make sure that these people do want to take this journey to live Can in I places like in Shanghai. Um, yeah. yeah, but I reckon that's probably, in my view, that's the opposite of reform, because that's forced urbanization, mm. that's pressuring people to move from the countryside rather than removing barriers. Um, mm. to allow them to come. And so that's the same old model, I think. I think that's partly the reason why um, Australia's terms of trade have just ticked up in the last few months because the iron ore prices jumped <laughs> up again because people see the same old mm. urbanisation, forced urbanisation model um, continuing. So I think that's you know, a, a, a worrying sign uh, of this. Of I, this mm. I, I think it's not a forced urbanisation mm. because urbanisation process is already, already there. Mm. There are two basic uh, uh, issues. One is people are already who are working in the urban area, you know, according to our hukou system. So they how to make them as a legal citizen, which a uh, normal citizen in the urban mm. will bring their family, their kids, and and, and th have a secured life. So uh, uh, enjoy all these uh, social uh, uh, security systems, and that's one line. Another line. There is still debate, so we understand, you know, well that experience lessens, you know, the quick urbanization in Latin America, in other developing countries. A lot of people just move, you know, into cities, fail to find a job, and become, a, you know, a, a absolute poor groups in the urban. So China still try to to prevent from that. So there is debate. Some group of people think. The future of urbanization to create more, uh, uh, you know, big cities, which can absorb most of the population. Uh, another group, I think, has now become very strong. China's future urbanization based on big, medium, and small, especially township-like, uh, you know, uh, cities. That does not mean, for instance, the the people will move all to the big cities. If you travel to southern part of China, so uh, actually most of the urbanized Happened in, the, in this, you know, uh, towns and cities. So not necessarily they all changed and to, to. So I think this is a very gradual, gradual process. But Li Keqiang take it as as a as a strong force to supporting the domestic demand, mobilize more resources to support economic growth, rather than as a political tool, you know, to to strengthen that uh, system and social stability. That's one thing. Another, I think, uh, uh, that is concerning, for instance, the, 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 the reform, the direction, for instance, Li Keqiang emphasized, that is how to change the state-owned enterprises. And the, he called these interest groups. 
uh, that uh, that there is also consensus now the state-owned enterprises uh, is too dominate in the key areas, but but direction is not just uh, is it, not to privatize, is it, to open the areas for the other private sectors. So that is traditional China's reform approach. It's not change the old one totally, but to open the, the door to the others to enter. So in the past 30 years, that is where you know most dynamic uh, part of the Chinese economy comes. So I think the, the state-owned enterprises also follow this approach. Richard wants to come yeah, Just going back to your original question, which this has all grown out of, obviously. Um, I, I think the leadership are, are very well aware of the dangers of potential divergence between uh, this change they intend to continue instituting, whether we call it reform or not, but anyway change to ec further economic and social change, and, and what people are thinking and what they like and, and what they don't like and how this could be problematical for them. And there have been a number of articles and speeches in, 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 in recent months referring back again to the experience of the 80s and saying, look, in the 80s, yes, the, the reform, we got, we got that right pretty well, that was all important, and, and we're going to keep on doing that sort of thing. But we ignored uh, ideological education, which actually, if you think back to the various campaigns of the course of 30s against spiritual pollution and so on and so forth, is a bit, a bit, a bit unjust. But nevertheless, you see this, so in, in, people became ideologically, there was ideological drift people became confused. I mean, quite recently, there have been a, a renewal of criticisms of the, um, uh, the, some, some, some of the, some of the main, main ideas, you know, uh, China needing to look to the Blue Sea rather than the, rather than the Yellow River and all these sort, sort of things. So, yes, we need to keep a stronger grip this time on, on you know, the main sort of ideological parameters, guidelines, whatever, as we push forward with this, with this reform. I think that's within limits. I think it's more directed to within the party than, 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 than society as, as a whole. But, but, well, but, I, but I, I think one of the um, issues we, we really uh, need to sort out is, is whether or not the, what I call sort of jargonistic terms, the sort of structural imperatives will allow that to happen. Uh, and John had a really, uh, let's put a bit of flesh on this before we open so this up to questions. I had one, one more sentence yeah. to go. But the, the yeah. other aspect of that was, what we're doing now is really difficult, so just shut up in the back of the car. You know, I'm driving, <laughs> I'm driving, this is difficult, <laughs> bumpy road, just shut up. And, and maybe when we get through, we can have another chat again, but this is tricky. But, but when a politician like Yu Jiangsheng starts talking about political reform, that is as reassuring to me as having Tony Blair in, in charge of the Middle East peace process. <laughs> I, I, I mean, if you translate like that, I voted for Tony Blair three times. I know what it's like to love a politician and then to unlove them. <laughs> so I guess the only thing I'd say for you today is do not look at these people and think that they are not politicians. They're politicians. Uh, John, you wrote a very interesting piece in, in, in the quarterly. Uh, on, on the Boer trial, and, and uh, that's full of implications for the structural imperatives of how, about how things have to be done now in China, yeah. given the, uh, the changes in the economy and society, the pluralistic uh, society. Um, um, you still have the same view, <laughs> a month later. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm glad you asked. It's a really difficult question. Mm -hmm. That was so perhaps two months since... Um, Six, six weeks since I wrote that, I think a lot has happened, and and I'm really questioning whether in that article I got my judgment wrong. Good Lord, we'd have to sack you. <laughs> politician, a politician. Well, tell, me, <laughs> tell me how you did. Well, in, that, in, in that argument, uh, I, you know, I thought, and I still think the Borsi Lai trial was extremely important. How they framed it was extremely important, and so. You know, the reformers kind of hoped but knew they wouldn't get a serious discussion of, of Bohr's kind of political line that he went too far to the left. So that didn't happen. Um, but it was important and reformers close to Xi Jinping thought it was very important in the way that the case was conducted. It was, a, it was um, 
I think, you know, as far as I know, you know, it was the most transparent and legally defensive, uh, sorry, procedurally defensible sensitive court trial in, in the People's Republic. So that's very significant. They thought that this is, you can no longer just kind of, they, they've got to, if they're going to put on a show trial, it's got to be much better than the one they did to Boar's Wife the year before. So you've got to convince people, you've got to bring people along. And in the end, that's part way to legal, to getting towards legal substance. So that was important and I don't sort of, I don't set slide backwards from that. But what I think I misjudged is, you know, perhaps that improvement, that recognition that the legal system has to improve has been swamped by other events all around it. And I think the single most important thing is um, what's happening in the internet space. And in the six years that I was in China, just uh, until recently, it was a remarkable story where the party was, you know, always putting people in jail and terrible things were happening, but civil society was growing and expanding. The room for dis debate and discourse was improving all the time. And so people were actually, you know, uh, Jung and his friends at CAS were having fantastic conversations, you know, all the time. And there was now a space to, to have these things. There was a virtual civil society that, had, you know, you could see growing up around you. And that's been, for the first time, been dramatically but limited in the last six or eight weeks. Well, you can tell us uh, how it can be effectively closed in a moment, perhaps. But Yung Ling, uh, I learned the big secret last night that you actually went to school with Bush, Bush and Lai. <laughs> so, so you got the drop on John. He knows nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so so, so uh, I'm sure you had a very intense interest for that reason as well as other reasons in the trial. So how do you interpret that? <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> I, I, I think uh, it's, it's, for me, it's very difficult to explain it in a very short time, the case. Mm. Take your uh, time. But, Take yeah. your time. <laughs> <laughs> but one thing is very clear, that is, if you see the, um, the case that, uh, that uh, the, it's very controversial matter. On, on the one hand, many people think he did a lot of good things, you know, change the city and improve the people's life. But on the other hand, the approach of his using the power, per, you know, is so highly on this personal matter. So actually, there is no any sense of the legal system, you know, and the, the others. So it's much based on this personal uh, uh, powers and wisdoms and you know ideas whatever styles so that I think probably will not be good if uh, uh, if uh, supposed to he is on the top so you can uh, do things whatever you like so the China is will move to this more legal based system that is one of very important uh, area of the political reform in the future so it's not happened in the past, and China will, the whole system and uh, the uh, economy, uh, society, the politics based on the legal system. So the, China has made a lot of you know, legal documents, regulations, but implementation is a long way to go. So you have to guide the politics, go to that direction. So on, on, on this matter, uh, uh, concerning, I think, uh, uh, the reform itself, there are two, a lot of social tensions now. One is mostly, if you see the social riots cases, mostly coming from la rural area relating to land system. This is a big issue, how to reform it, because China is you know, state-owned, collective-owned land system. Uh, in this quick industrialization, urbanization, so land has a high price. So if you link this land to the power and also market, so there is the shift of the, of the profit, where to go. Now it's mostly going to the state controlled you know, uh, uh, property. Uh, and so that is where there comes a lot of uh, uh, corruption is coming from. Most of the cases, the corruption of link to this land actually, sailing. So this is one area how to reform it. But it's simply, I think it's very difficult to just privatize the land to, to the farmers. But they will, the direction will give more the rights for, for the farmers 
uh, from next year, probably the farmers will get the certificate of land use and for uh, 15 or 30 years. So that means you have the right to decide. You have the right to benefit to get if your land. So this in urbanization, industrialization process, uh, uh, if you see the European uh, experience in the past, uh, it's a very, very difficult uh, 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 transformation, but it is specially considered. So most cases now relating to this. Another one is social justice, relating to legal system. That is who decide the, you know, uh, who decide and how they decide. That's leading to, I think, uh, uh, the government politics and also to the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the structure of politics, for instance. We had the reform relating to the courts, you know, uh, and, and, and so uh, they, they found a problem which uh, uh, probably uh, uh, hurt the party's power and then this reform went back. But now it will, I think it will come back again. You have to solve this issue. So we'll see probably a lot of new reforms in the forthcoming you know, meeting and on this uh, area. So the two basic, I think also social you know, uh, distribution on equal, and uh, that's relating to the first one. That is a lot of uh, uh, cases of uh, corruptions relating to how to share. So uh, relating to his uh, point that uh, why the new leaders use a lot of Mao's you know, uh, uh, slogans and sayings, I think uh, try to show that we have to clean the party. Sure. And we have to make party and, and as a good party. Sure. <laughs> so that's probably the root of Communist Party. So that does not mean they will follow the Mao's approach. Uh, so that, that that's, I think, uh, is quite different. That's not to prevent from this any kind of a reform in the, in the future. Uh, I want to throw uh, uh, the panel open to questions from the audience. Uh, we've got some mics here. Good. Uh, so uh, uh, please uh, indicate if you'd like to ask a question down here, please. Yeah. Thank you very much. Brian Martin from uh, the ANU here. Um, Could you hold the mic just against your chin? Yeah, yeah okay, like that. <laughs> uh, this has been a wonderful panel, and thank you very much for, for pr your presentations. I was fascinated by, uh, in fact, listening to you all, the contradictions in your different positions on, uh, <laughs> on the issues. And I was particularly fascinated by Professor Zhang's call uh, on the need, uh, implication of the need for political reform, or various types of political reform, as well as economic reform in the future. And I wondered whether, in fact, and you emphasized legal reform, and I think also Mr. Garno also emphasized uh, the issue of legal reform in the, in the context of the Boise Lai case. Um, but legal reform is, uh, is uh, very difficult. How far can you take politics out of the law in China? How far can Chinese judges be seen to be independent of political pressures. And uh, this is a key thing for, for, for legal reform. Um, so um, I will leave it at that, although I had some, oh yes, okay. one, one, one further question, which also came from Professor Zhang's uh, statement. <laughs> and that is the issue of uh, the land use reform, the, the concept that land issues are one of the most uh, important social problems in China today. Now the issue, the, of uh, the decentralization of uh, decision making, economic decision making others within uh, the system will enhance the powers of local government. And of course it's the local governments, the sub-provincial governments that are perhaps the worst offenders in terms of these uh, the, uh, the land issues. So how can you actually control them from the center when you're devolving increasing powers to them? Would you like to have a go at that last question? No? Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I hope you uh, and, then, and, then the, and then the big question we'll put back well, to uh, Yun Ling and, and John. <laughs> I, I didn't go to school with Bo Xi Lai, but I did, go to, I did go to the same school as Mick Jagger, so, you know. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, I, I mean, 
le legal reform is very privileged. You, you know, this is sort of meant to lead to all sorts of uh, you know wonderful things in China. But I mean, I guess the thing, for instance, uh, Wang Xiangjian and um, Zhou Tianyong in a book they wrote in 2007 about uh, reform in China um, from the party school, although published by Xinjiang Publishing House, um, had this statement that uh, you know everyone wants reform. I mean, it's one of those nice words. And a politician using those words will always have a good response from the audience. But of course, they are pretty empty. I mean, what, what, what's reform? The, the thing um, is that legal reform involves attacking someone's profit. <laughs> you, you know, at the end of the day, you, you go along a journey where you are going to end up um, kind of getting in the way of someone's vested interest. So I think hovering behind all that we've said this morning is this issue of an elite but it's only one elite, and they are going to be doing things against other vested interests. The party corporately has one thing. It is like Midas. Whatever it touches turns to profit. So the China dream to me only has any meaning, really, to answer your question finally, <laughs> if it's got a budget. If it's got a budget, then we can dream. <laughs> you know. Um, and I'm sure that there'll be a little office in the central leading group for China Dreaming, which will have a budget. It will become a source of vested interest. And we will have this wonderful paradox of a China in which dreaming is part of a vested interest. Um, the legal reform, when it starts to affect this vested interest and cut back on people's um, I I I ability to have profits, then becomes highly toxic and political. And I mean, does this leadership have the real ability to hit that? Um, I mean, I think they have to be very tactical in the way they hit it. So the oil sector, they are kind of hitting at the moment. Um, but I mean, the idea that they would remove, why do they have to give up powers now when they don't have to? That they'll give them up when they have to, but at the moment, if you were sitting in Zhongnan High, why would you give up the ability to smash your judges over the head and do what you want? You don't have to at the moment, but one day you will have to. Your name? Uh, concerning the legal reform, I think there are, I'm not the expert on that, from my understanding, there are two basic uh, issues. One is the make the legal system useful and um, powerful to protect the individual's rights and benefits. That is, you know, the legal system is not uh, that powerful uh, and enough. So that, that's a direction to go. A lot of, uh, you know, uh, problems now in relating to social rights, relating to that. It's not, they think it's, uh, it's not justifiable. So that make, the second, I think, most difficult, that is relation between the party leadership and, and the legal system. So, as I mentioned, we tried in the past and they make, for instance, the court and judges and uh, in, uh, uh, independent of their uh, the decisions. But if you make, for instance, the, the judge independent uh, uh, out of this party's leadership, and then you can <coughs> think, why just judges? Mm -hmm. All the others. Mm -hmm. So they relating to the whole reform of party's role and, and the le legal system's role, the position, how to define the two. So this is a very basic political reform, which need, I think, uh, still a long time. We tried in 1980s, but uh, immediately fine. You see, the, uh, like uh, the uh, People's Congress, and in the past, that we try to make it more powerful, independent, and you know, uh, uh, but later we find where is the party's role? If uh, Congress have no party's role, and, and then they can challenge, and then you know they they can raise the voices against the leaders. So that is very basic. Now and then later, uh, during that uh, Li Peng's time, and then back. Now the party uh, secretary as the chairman of the of the Congress, and and also the back to this uh, judges uh, for most important cases, not every case. And then you must uh, uh, consider the party committee's decision. 
on, on most of judges now as Communist Party member, actually there is no, if party member just follow the party's line and you make an independent decision, that's okay. So that's probably the future you know, direction. You have a clean politics, you have a, you know, a, a good party, so the party member, uh, you know, so whatever, th that's two basic uh, direction, but I think it will continue to go. Uh, why recently there is debate in China, you know, constitution, the role, what's a Western style to constitution based political system? They still the, come to the basic question that uh, that system needs change of the party. It creates an opposition. So that is why, you know, the, the, the current group of leaders against that kind of uh, uh, direction of the argument. So that not to prevent from the reform of, so this legal reform is a very long process, probably come to the 50, by 2050, 2050. hope. <laughs> no, it's a long way. Uh, uh, the second uh, issue related. I think the real, the real question is, is whether the system and its ambitions, especially in respect of economic liberalization, can be sustained without an earlier reform process. Uh, May I answer this uh, land reform? I think the local government, uh, I think it's, uh, as I mentioned, this land reform come to this stage, the land become, you know, has a, a high price, has a link to the power, whatever. Also, specifically, this land system relating to also the current central local uh, uh, relationships. Because the central government now the tax revenue, they got majority of the tax revenue to the cent central. So the local takes about 70% of all this, you know, social uh, uh, responsibilities, administrations, but they got 40% of the tax revenue. So there's a big gap they have to find a way. One is to find the, uh, you know, uh, the car drivers and the others, you know, ways to collect the money. The land really become a very rich resource for them to get the money. So, um, so in the future, also relating to land system reform and relating to this uh, tax uh, system uh, reform system, we, uh, we also see the forthcoming uh, documents relating to this uh, central and and, and uh, uh, local government and also how to redistribute the uh, power and responsibilities be between the central and local. Uh, any, another question? Yeah. Um, so thank you for, for the panel today. It's been really interesting. My name's Garrett Schmidt. I'm an undergraduate student here at ANU. Um, I was wanting to go back to um, what Zhang Yunling said about um, state-owned owned enterprises, and specifically related to um, energy security, because um, I know in, in Xinjiang, um, a lot of the reason for the state-owned enterprise prizes that do a lot of the resource extraction there is related to energy security. Um, and if you're privatizing um, and opening up to, oh, not privatizing, but opening up to competition, um, potentially you're uh, loosening government control over the, over the resources that are taken out of Xinjiang and um, loosening um, energy security concerns. Um, and so I was wondering, related to en energy security, um, what the Chinese government's stance on that might be, or going into the future? Uh, actually, the system has changed and, uh, in the past because the resources exploited by the state-owned enterprises, they got everything back to their company the revenue, the, 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 uh, they pay, you know, the tax to the central, so it belong to the central state on. There is no any kind of a shared interest with the local, but now there's already, they have changed about three, three years ago. So the Xinjiang get their share, and uh, they, they now the resource. So this, this, uh, this extremist groups is not because of this, uh, uh, that's resource uh, sharing because of the other uh, matters of that. So uh, there are two places uh, now they can get their local share. One is uh, 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 Yang'an, that's a big oil, uh, but because the old revolutionary, you know, backward area, they, they 
get a large share first. But now Xinjiang, so th this system, will, I think, is will further go uh, to, to, to be implemented in other areas be between the, uh, the, the local and the central. And also, uh, there are increasing local uh, resource companies, not just that uh, all, everything go back to, to the central. So that's also another way of you know, sharing the, the, the benefits of that. We're running out of time, but let me take another one or two questions from the floor before we turn back to... Yes, just here, you've got a microphone? Can't no, 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 you can't. <laughs> You're talking to me, you can't project well enough. <laughs> Thank you everyone for a very interesting panel discussion on what's happening inside China. I was wondering if I could ask um, for your impressions of the China we're seeing on the global stage. So, any observations on China's foreign policy at the moment? Richard? Uh, a, a quick stab. Um, not all that long ago, some quite well-informed uh, people thought that perhaps um, China's foreign policy wasn't going to be very high on the agenda, and it's certainly true that I think everything in China, and China is not unique in this regard, is, is domestically driven, perhaps in China more so than in most other places, given just the, the sheer range and, and intractability of many of the problems that China faces domestically. But that being, that, that being the case, that there might be a, 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 an element of passivity in, in the way the current leadership pursue their foreign policy. But everything that I'm seeing so far tells me it's precisely the opposite, and, and that Xi in particular is driving this. Uh, and in this and in other regards, he's, he's clearly in charge. And uh, the role that he played uh, in this recent uh, meeting where he gave this keynote speech on uh, China's regional policy, policy towards the neighbors, uh, as I said, with the entire Politburo Standard Committee lined up behind him, shows very, very clearly that he's, he's, got, he's got clear ideas, he's got strong ideas, and he's, and he's gonna, gonna kind of push things quite hard. Um, he himself is clearly, and, and I think you know, he, he is really going to be more than anybody else the foreign policy person on, on the Politburo. Uh, and that, that may be no bad thing in some ways, because he, 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 he's clear in, in, in his thinking, um, and uh, he thinks strategically, uh, but it will also, I think, in some ways be uncomfortable for people who got used to, uh, uh, you know, China perhaps, be, perhaps being a little bit more reactive or more or less going, going along, you know. His gut feelings uh, about, about some aspects of dealing with foreigners or the way foreigners seek to deal with China, I think were made clearly, uh, fairly clear in his allegedly off-the-cuff remarks to Chinese students in Mexico, you know, a couple of years back, you know, we've got these foreigners who, who you, know, you know, fill their faces and then, then criticize China about this. They said, what are we doing? You know, we're not exporting revolution, you know, we're not trying to change the world and all this sort of thing. You know, what, are, what do they want from us? That was sort of the gut level. But since taking over power, I mean, his, his visit to the Soviet Union, first really important visit, that, that was quite clear. Some people were surprised by that. I think he knew exactly what Soviet Union, beg your pardon, I'm just old speak. <laughs> showing, showing my age, <laughs> Russia. <laughs> um, <laughs> but whatever, that, 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 that big place that we sometimes tend, tend to think doesn't matter all that much any, a, anymore, but the Chinese understand is very important. And uh, I, I it's quite interesting in the most recent recent book on Chinese foreign policy by um, uh, uh, Ye Xuetong in, um, in, in Tsinghua, we, we, you know, he advocates that it's time for China to give up the idea of not forming alliances. We need to start forming alliances now because other countries do it too. And who, who should we form an alliance with? The Russians. There is nobody else. You know, we've got the greatest, uh, greatest area, area of common interest. They matter. This, this will help. Interesting. So he goes off to Russia. But the good thing, I think, one of the good things from our point of view about, uh, about Xi is he clearly has a very good understanding of the absolute importance of trying to get that China-US relationship right. And that's got to be good news for us in Australia because there's, there's nothing that more determines the circumstances you know, of our in overall environment. But you know, he's, he's going to be in charge. He's going, he's going to push things. But it's not just Russia. This regional policy is really, really important. And the question that occurs to me, though, he says all these things about how we have to be so nice to the countries in the region, to our neighbors, 
especially the neighbors, not just to our neighbors. Where does Japan fit into that? That's another question altogether. I think one way well, of framing it is um, <laughs> he's remembered the friends part of the enemies and friends equation from the, <laughs> from the first sentence of Mao's collected works. Let's spend a bit more time on, on this. I wanted to do that. Thanks for the question. Uh, in, the Deng Lo posture policy is, is no longer viable, so to think that you can manage domestic affairs purely domestically is no longer a vi viable strategy. It seems to me uh, that the present leadership uh, understands that in spades. Uh, Yun Ling, you wanted to come in on precisely that issue, especially the US relationship, I think. I think uh, the concerning the foreign policy, that is, the leaders, new leaders, emphasize again and again their principle uh, that uh, for their foreign policy is still to try to keep uh, that peace and development good environment. That is serve this target because without it, that uh, you know you can't realize whatever they uh, should do in the domestic uh, uh, development. Uh, but the challenge of, uh, I think there are three challenges. One is, of course, China-U.S. relationship, how to manage. According to traditional theory, they must have a war. And many people, they think, uh, you know, they, they sooner or later. But uh, for leaders, I think they, they, they try to prevent from that. That is why they call on this, uh, you know, uh, the new power relationship. So a new power relationship, the centerpiece is prevent from any kind of uh, possibility of confrontation, seek any possibility of uh, consultation and cooperation. So that's why they, so with a new style they, they met uh, uh, between Obama and Xi Jinping. That is rare, you know, it's the informal uh, consultations and talks and, and that get, you know, uh, at least the image that so we are flexible, we are friends, and you know, so we can make uh, any kind of uh, a possible uh, 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 arrangements and developments if uh, we, we, we share the uh, together. Uh, coming to the point also now recently, suddenly, they, in, in 18, uh, 18th Party Congress document, the first time in Party Congress document, you this, we are living in one world. So they emphasize we are now later use this term of uh, community of destiny. So this is very puzzled. And people ask me, what does it mean that, uh, you know, community of destiny? <coughs> so I think it's very simple to emphasize we are living together. We have to work together. So that shows China's interest close linked to the others. So we are a rising power, but uh, we, we do not want to you know, dominate, we, we are living as uh, the partners together. So, so it's quite, uh, I think it's clear direction, but, but the challenge, the second challenge is how to manage is this changing uh, relations between China and its neighbors. <coughs> and, and especially how to manage this uh, emerging uh, uh, confrontations relating to, not mostly to the land, but to the sea, and, uh, and, and so on, because China will become a sea power at the same time. And, and so it's increasing confrontations among this, how to manage this. Uh, the, the, the third challenge, I think, the role, China's role. What kind of role China should play in the regional and domestic uh, affairs? Uh, as as uh, mentioned, uh, that recently Xi Jinping in this conference emphasize again and again what the China need is still a peaceful uh, environment for its development. And we have to make ourselves close to our neighbors and uh, we have to manage the, this kind of a confrontation. So I, I think that shows the leaders uh, a key concern and rather than as a challenging power try to, but they have the problem that because China has become strong, and people, you know, they have a higher requirement on their, on them. The people uh, want them become a very strong leader uh, to defend uh, what China, uh, the so-called core interest, and also they ask the leaders and uh, find a way to get back what China lost in the past when China was weak. So it's uh, you know, 
if, if you read the Chinese you know, website and the comments are from people, that's majority views. So they think leaders are so, so weak, vulnerable, and, uh, and fail to defend the China's interests and so on. So they have to manage between this stable, peaceful, cooperative environment and increasing China's you know, uh, interest and also demand from, from the society. Uh, uh, I, I think the key, I think, is still probably uh, China-U.S. relationship. And, and relating to the relations between neighbors, we, we have to, I, I think we have two kind of relations now with neighbors. One is bilateral with each country. Most of these bilateral relations are good. And, uh, but uh, another kind of rela new emerging relationship with the regions. We have Central Asia, we have uh, Southeast Asia, South Asia, Northeast Asia. So this, uh, for good side, is we have already, in each area, uh, we have established this regional uh, mechanism, cooperation through FTA, through the uh, plus dialogue, through Shanghai organization. And this has never happened in China's history. So that means we have a group of countries who can sit together to talk about a shared interest rather than just bilateral. So also the, the Japan. Japan, I think, is not a pure bilateral relationship. We have uh, some uh, three kind of uh, relations. One is bilateral. Another is regional in Northeast Asia. Uh, another that is China-US relationship. So I don't think leaders prepare to fight a war with this, uh, you know, Dewey Island, and uh, uh, neither uh, of these uh, uh, Japan leaders. They, but this national, uh, this this uh, 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 territory disputes is most difficult, complex issues to be handled. But they, they, I, I think both of China and Japan leaders remember where, where their key uh, interests are. So that, that is until now, and it's still manageable. I'll hold you back, Kerry, because I just want to take one last question <coughs> from Ron here, and then we'll have to close it because we've run out of time. Ron? Yes, oh, okay. very much. A quick one. Yeah, I want to pick up on, on the new model of major power relationships, and your very insightful observation that we might be witnessing the first generation of Chinese politicians in modern times. This is an inherently difficult business between major powers, one rising, one static, if you like. It's always going to remain loose and relatively vague. But when you look at what China has articulated, if you like, about this new model, official China, said almost nothing, to my knowledge. I haven't read Xi Jinping's uh, Jinping speech on, on uh, common destiny. What they've allowed is, is a number of key academics, possibly selected academics, to elaborate the proposal. When you read those elaborations, the gulf between what we understand by a policy document and what the Chinese understand by a policy document is immense. It, it says almost nothing. So the question? The question is, <laughs> what are the odds that the new, the new political leadership in China, as, as politicians, will agree to translate their ideas into something which is intelligible to their key partners and not remain at this very vague and abstract level that commits them to almost nothing. Good. Anyway. Uh, John? I just think that's not how the system works, that you keep all options open all the time. Um, and you, you speak on multiple levels, and I don't think China's self-perceived interests are um, enhanced by, by specifying any roadmap. They never have been before, and I don't think that's going to change. Yeah, just on the USSR, I remember one comment about it, Richard, is that the reason why it would collapse is because it could never take yes for an answer. <laughs> and I suppose uh, for, for, um, for China, maybe that's the danger. Um, I mean, just three things. Whenever I um, meet Peter, I always want to go and, go and set someone homework. Um, and so I feel like I should set you all um, a bit of homework. Um, three books, just very quickly, that have helped me understand China from totally different way, ways. Christopher Clark, uh, a wonderful book, he's a professor of Chi um, history at Cambridge, called The Sleepwalkers, about the origins of the First World War. And he describes the complete disconnect between a bureaucratic machinery of advice and consultation and elite leaders. And it's eerie 
how that kind of is reflected in Beijing now. Who are the advisors around this kind of uh, you know, elite leadership? Who is giving them advice, as you just referred to? Um, it's a kind of eerie kind of overlap. The second is Rana Mitter's very good new book on the Japan-China war. And the thing that I came away from that was you know, the idea of um, that we're, you know, Europeans, Australians, Americans, but particularly Americans, um, are unreliable allies. And in the 40s, we really didn't give um, China the support then of being good allies. And I think the historic memory stain from that is very profound, very finely, and completely unconnected to anything we've said today. Um, the final chapter of the Fat Years by Chen Gung Kang um, has the sort of wonderful idea that in order to improve people's mood, the national government spikes the water and <laughs> drugs it. And this is why people are deliriously happy in China. <laughs> so I experimented last week in Beijing by eat, uh, drinking some of the water. And I did find the world improved <laughs> greatly around me. So it is a real bummer that they're running out of water. <laughs> uh, Yunling, on a serious note. <laughs> No, concerning, uh, he heard in the Beijing, for instance, some guys call on China make alliance, and, and I think, I, I think right, this, view, yeah, this view is still very minority. Yeah, no, I'm very aware of that. So, uh, so I he's, don't a, he's think, an intellect, he's an academic, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, Yang Xuetong's view is very clear. We uh, unified all these uh, regular states, and, and <laughs> we were China as a leader to against the United States. I think it's... Um, that, that's very rare view. No, I'm, I'm view. Very well the, <laughs> the majority well. view, I think, is still China for the for the current leaders have to find a way, you know, uh, to to manage uh, this complex relationship, which uh, um, possibly to make it stable, avoid any kind of a big risks. And for Russia, they sh they find a lot of uh, shared interest, but uh, we fully understand what uh, where are the confrontations and differences that they are. Uh, just one final question to the lot of you, and then we, we have to wrap it up. Uh, I think underlying the, the conversation this morning is, is the question about the tension uh, between political reform and, and uh, economic reform ambitions, uh, and how that'll pan out over time. If, if you, each of you, in one sentence, if you look ahead 10 years or 20 years, Yunling might want to look ahead 50 years, but anyway, uh, if you look ahead 10 or 15 years, uh, what do you expect uh, in terms of uh, change in political system? Gary. A radically pragmatic leadership will be struck by some kind of crisis in the next decade in which they will have to make changes that uh, utterly transform the role of China and its domestic polity, and therefore we have to a quote from Wittgenstein, I went into the room wanting to be surprised and wasn't, which surprised me. <laughs> <laughs> Richard, we'll take you next and we're going to give you and Ling the last Bugger, word. I thought I had more time to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think this, this 10 years is going to be really, really, really crucial. You know, the last mob were lucky they managed to get through theirs, passing the parcel. It's, it's not going to be easy, easy this time. They, they might bring it off, but, but if they don't, then I think you know, radical changes, all, all bets are off, which is why we need to be as across as we possibly can all the debates that are going on in China, because we think about the rise of China, the question is what sort of a China, and there are a variety of possibilities. John? Um, well, I started talking about passing the parcel. <laughs> I saw another, and that was from a, a princeling in Beijing, I saw another great quote from a princeling in Beijing just two weeks ago when he said, um, I wish they'd go back to passing the parcel. You <laughs> 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 uh, I think for these leaders, if we suppose the, you know, they continue for the next 10 years, the, uh, as I mentioned, I, I would see the big change of this China's legal system, which uh, make it uh, workable and uh, powerful. And, and on the other matter, I think uh, the key concern for the leaders is still the domestic um, comprehensive reforms that they have to go and one by one area and in a deeper steps gradually. Uh, before I close the session, uh, <coughs> let me make uh, one or two important announcements. The first important announcement is that somebody left their car keys on the registration desk out there. They're held for you so when you go out you'll find them at the desk. 
the second important announcement is that uh, we'll have a little time with the panelists over tea on the way out, so please join us for tea and coffee for individual conversation on the way out. But let me join with you, I'm sure, in thanking uh, the panelists for what's been an excellent session. <laughs>